supercomputing 2023. Uh, mm-hmm. Matt, you and I, uh, you and I partied there, almost got squished by 10,000 people, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, up, uh, up the line. I literally felt like I was at, at the Consumer Electronics Show. The only difference was the IQ is probably uh, 50 points higher on everybody there, uh, yes. not including me, of course, and nobody mm-hmm. was drunk. So. <laughs> that's true too <laughs> that is so true that is so true it shows you yeah just how smart they are yeah you know i have to say supercomputing might be my favorite show um what <laughs> you know it is a it is a nerds like dream come true right it's i mean it, it yeah. truly is it and it's because it's the best of everything and it's kind of science fiction come to life in many ways. Um, I, I absolutely love it. And here, so so kind of that bleeds right into first thing. First takeaway is I couldn't believe. I'm always shocked every year at how crowded supercomputing is and how popular it is. Yeah. You know, you go to these vendor shows and they have, you know, twenty thousand customers, fifteen thousand customers, whatever it is, and they're all customers, and they're, but they're all there. Kind of, it's it's more business as usual. Supercomputing, it is just kind of an organic um, growth of academia, research, um, and commercial nerds coming together to share best practices. Um, absolutely, so I love it. But three big takeaways. But I'll give you four. First is silicon is more vibrant than ever, um, without a doubt. You know, when we think of silicon, again, you know, kind of my brain goes to servers and it's amd intel arm nvidia um you know throw qualcomm in there as well but you forget how vibrant silicon is and you know maya and cobalt are just an example of that's that that happened out of ignite but just example of like how how innovative the silicon space is becoming and how quick the rate of innovation has become as well remember it used to yeah you used to see chips come out every three years four years or so I mean, there was a reason for it, but there is just a consistent drumbeat of new silicon startups coming out every month, it seems. And they all collect at supercomputing to talk about how, you know, to talk about their latest innovations. Part one. Part two, in the era of open source, which is what HPC supercomputing AI is all about, maybe not AI, but HPC and supercomputing is all about, the big guys have never been more represented. I was shocked at the presence that H, uh, that HPE, Lenovo, Dell, Intel, AMD, so on and so forth, and Microsoft had at Supercomputing 2023. And I know they always have a, a good presence, but um, it, they are, you know, their presence was their presence was huge. And it, it, again, it shows that you know while we think of these players as kind of like standard server or maybe as a service um, providers, they really there is a lot of innovation going on in these companies as well. Um, and IBM, I'll throw in there as well. Uh, number three, is supercomputing all about storage? I could not believe the size of Vast's and Pure Storage's booth at uh, Supercomputing 23. Yeah. And those stupid cowboy hats. I, I admire them. By the way, Daniel Newman took one with him and walked <laughs> out and he went to the airport and everybody was looking at him really funny like, are you possibly a dancer? from las vegas with that hat oh that's did funny you, the question is did you go home with one i did not i wouldn't even put one of those on i don't have a head for hats um i just see ugly and i i walk away so yeah now just in full transparency he brought one back to one of his kids and i thought that was really sweet so yeah that is that is very cool but they were huge and vast had a huge presence pure had a huge presence weka um, lots of lots of um, lot of, of of storage companies there, and it, it really kind of reminds us that how critical storage, but really data, is to the kind of the supercomputing equation, right? We all know that, um, but we forget that these storage companies aren't just providing disks that you can store data on. They're doing a lot around data management. Last thing I want to hit on is cooling, and I hit on it kind of touched on it a second ago, but I could not believe the number of cooling companies that were at supercomputing and it really speaks to the recognition that enterprise organizations are, are kind of um, starting to realize around 
the growth that's going on in the data center, the the TDPs of these these CPUs, GPUs, ASICs, and other uh, pieces of silicon that are populating the data center more and more, and the need to figure out a way to lower your power consumption. I mean, you know, when you when you look at data center cooling, it's forty percent cooling is forty percent of the power budget, right? You got to figure out a way to do things smarter and take up less of a footprint. So, those are my four really big takeaways. And again, I know I'm going through fast because I I tend to ramble on, but um, but man, I love that show. And Pat, I know you have a lot of thoughts about uh, supercomputing as well, so I didn't want to steal your thunder. Yeah, it's a good show. Hadn't been there uh, five or six years uh, pre P. I don't use the word so when it get flagged, uh, but no, it was uh, it was pretty big. Um, you know, marketing dollars are tight overall, and not a whole lot of people make a whole lot of money in uh, in supercomputing. It's kind of the thing to lose money on, particularly at the uh, the big national labs. And what you do is you get them to pay for your intellectual property and your engineers. So you can take that IP and use it other places where you can make money. So. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a freemium uh, type of model. No, uh, <laughs> first thing is uh, we're seeing a movement from flops to tops, okay? Yeah. And uh, for decades, it was all about floating operations, floating point operations per second, right? Yeah. How do you do simulations, weather simulations, <laughs> crash simulations, not nuclear simulations. No, 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 no. <laughs> We're just doing weather simulations at the Department of Energy. Um, and you know, it's it's code. I've got some funny AMD stories that uh, if uh, they didn't cut off my internet, I, I, I might tell. But uh, anyways, flops to tops. You know, if we've seen in, in, in technology, rarely do technologies uh, die. They just decline, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I think you can safely say the fax machine is pretty much dead uh, in most parts uh, of the world, but uh, it's typically additive, right? Machine yep. learning didn't kill analytics. Deep learning didn't kill machine learning, and generative AI is not going to kill kill the deep learning. Okay, it's it, yep. it's additive. So, uh, and that's what's going on here. But what I did here, and I I actually uh, interviewed with the Imperial College, uh, Flatiron Institute, uh, and L at the folks at uh, LRZ, and Every one of their research directors told me, all in on AI, okay? All in AI. It's giving us new ways to figure out the problems. And uh, people inside of the universities and my users, they want to be able to do that. And it's not the first time we've seen uh, AI being introduced. Uh, What was happening is they were using AI to uh, narrow in the problem set, and then they would throw flops against it. Now they're looking at this amazing uh, multivariate, multi-parameter, uh, foundational model approach to do uh, real wackadoodle things in between uh, now and when uh, quantum computing uh, pretty much uh, reinvents that um, entire place. No, <laughs> I, I saw that. Multi- using AI for quantum now too, so. Exactly. Uh, and and that, that's what's great about all this technology uh, and um, more more innovation uh, a lot a lot quicker. Uh, a lot of CEOs uh, were there, too, of these companies that don't ne- necessarily uh, stand for classic high performance computing. Uh, I met with uh, Jonathan Ross, uh, the CEO of Grok, mm-hmm. an ASIC based uh, solution that runs you know, Lambda 30 billion parameter model uh, about uh, 10x faster and more efficient. It's an ASIC. Guess what? And I think by the way, it's fabbed in 16 nanometer or maybe 12. Yeah. Um, again, just just reinforcing that. I uh, met with the CEO of a company called Axiato that uh, essentially has a plug-in card uh, that replaces uh, BCM, uh, Root of Trust, and a lot of the popcorn uh, that enables uh, multi multi CPU and multi GPU brands who have been plopping this stuff either inside of of the SOC. So uh, I, I was uh, really uh, really Im, Im impressed with this. So yeah, those are those were some of my my key takeaways. I think I was there for 24 hours. Uh, you know, showed up you and I to. Toast, uh, yeah. HP's, yeah. Uh, Aurora, 
uh, being the number two fastest while, by the way, uncertified and using half the capacity. That's right. I think yeah. that's, the, uh, that's the takeaway. I want to make sure we we uh, we uh, we get that right. Spent a lot of time with uh, Lenovo. Lenovo is still the market share leader uh, in high performance computing, um, and they do fifty uh, percent. They have fifty percent market share just in Western Europe, which is yeah. is pretty pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey one last, yeah. can I throw one last thing in there? I was. I was you can. It's your show, dude. <laughs> it's your I show, probably- not mine. <laughs> I was I was surprised to see, um, and I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on this. So um, there were three three cloud providers there, uh, GPU cloud providers there, Lambda Labs, um, CoreWeave, and Vulture. And um, oh, there's a AI thing. Yeah, I know it's a ghost over my shoulder. And um, I, I'm kind of curious as to what your thoughts are around kind of these AI cloud, if you will, or GPU cloud players and, you know, the impact they have on the likes of AWS, Azure, not really impact, but I guess the cloud market in general. Do you see this opportunity for bespoke clouds, so to speak? (laughs) I see this opportunity as like a really teeny tiny one and they need to get uh, in there and strike while the iron's hot. So uh, CSPs didn't use water. And uh, it's cool. And Mm -hmm. uh, these new breed of folks do. One of these, CoreWeave, is uh, partially owned or invested in by NVIDIA, which means that they can get they can get uh, GPU. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think there's going to be an opportunity uh, for these folks if they're not just propping up services for NVIDIA cards, right? right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they can provide some heterogeneity out there and 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 some choice. Because when it comes to the AWSs, uh, the Azures, and even the OCIs and Google Clouds, they need scale, mm-hmm. right? They need to put this in, they, they, need to, they need to stand up a new piece of silicon in 27 different data centers, right? Yeah. Whereas suppose these smaller ones uh, who, by the way, are typically in a colo and an Equinix or uh, digital realty yeah. uh, where they don't have uh, as much of the pressure. So I'd like to see, you know, Habana too. Uh, I'd like to see uh, Grok uh, in there as, uh, as, as an example. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let's move to the, yeah. What, what, what do you think? Are these uh, flash in the pan based on the inability to get GPUs or, or something different? No, and I, I don't mean to to belabor it. I, no, I, I I'm I'm with you. I think, you know, I think I, I see it as an opportunity, like you, kind of the smaller, more agile, an opportunity to strike while the iron's hot, certainly. Um, and I see with some of them more than just renting out GPUs. Actually, all of them have some additive service uh, on top of, um, you know, the platforms. And I do think that not owning my own real estate and having to worry about owning my own real estate gives them a little bit of agility, but you know, it, you land and you got to expand and where do you expand to, right? That's the, that's the part that I get stuck on. 